Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit, one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm here with Dr. Robert Pippin. Dr. Robert uh, Pippin is a uh, distinguished service professor at the University of Chicago, and we're talking about his book, Philosophy by Other Means. Dr. Pippin, wonderful to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so just before we get into the book, which for those on YouTube, you can see it there. We'll have a link down below. Um, Tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you get into philosophy and what led you? Uh, I know you've written several books. That's kind of apparent at the beginning. Like this has been a lifelong project for you. Why this project? Why uh, philosophy and art and that intersection? Well, I, I started out in college as an English major, um, quite seriously interested in uh, literature, especially international literature. Um, and I, I was preparing. I thought I was going to be a writer, a short story, novel writer, poet. Um, but by my senior year in college, I had taken a lot of philosophy courses and, you know, I sort of had to face the fact that while I was, uh, okay, I wasn't good enough to be a, uh, uh, a serious professional writer. Um, mm. so I, you know, rather than spend 10 years waiting on tables in New York and staying up late writing stories that would get rejected, um, I, I had formed, especially, uh, in the end of my junior year. Um, a deep attachment to philosophy, especially the history of philosophy, Greek and German philosophy in particular. Mm. So at the very last minute in sort of October of my senior year, I applied to uh, graduate school and I had a teacher I respected um, a great deal who I said I wanted to study basically the history of philosophy and especially the European tradition, um, uh, Kant and German idealism, post-Kantian, uh, post-idealist uh, philosophy in Europe like Nietzsche and Heidegger. And at that time, um, this was 50 years ago, um, at that time, uh, American philosophy departments were um, not terribly interested in either the history of philosophy or um, uh, European philosophy. So I went to a, a kind of second tier graduate program by the standards of the profession um, at Penn State, uh, at working there with a man named Stanley Rosen. I mean, I, I kept a very strong interest in literature and the intersection between literature and philosophy. Um, but I, you know, once you once you go to graduate school and you get a credential and you get a job and you have to teach your specialty, I wasn't able to um, to pursue what I thought of as various ways of philosophy and reflective high culture literature intersecting with each other. Um, but in 1992, uh, I was teaching then at the University of California in San Diego. And in 1992, I got an offer from the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago, which is um, your your listeners can sort of Google it and see what kind of a program it is. It's a Ph.D. granting program that is uh, uh, explicitly uh, interdisciplinary. Um, mm. uh, we don't have the usual kind of program of a graduate school. Students come and take whatever courses they want. They don't have to take a series of field requirements or something like that. And they're encouraged to write dissertations that don't fit into the standard academic departments, um, say the intersection between Greek literature and Greek philosophy or um, the, the history of uh, Stoicism and its relevance to Kant or um, the, the, the bearing of, uh, of uh, philosophy on literature, for example. Um, so that gave me kind of permission to uh, teach and write about whatever I wanted to, which mm. was you know, like the Mount Olympus of philosophy. I mean, I sort of arrived in academic heaven. No, no assigned courses, no repetitive courses. I could teach something different each year. And it was a collection of, especially when I first came, there were people like Saul Bellow and Lesek Kolakowski and uh, Francois Furet and all kinds of very 
luminous, incredibly famous people. Um, and I was just tremendously stimulated to start doing what I want. So the first foray into this was a book um, in 2000 called uh, Henry James and Modern Moral Life, um, which was an attempt to show how uh, James in his novels was raising questions about the status of of moral life in uh, a late modern world in which the conventional assumptions about the basis of morality had collapsed, that there, there wasn't a, a consensus of that. So I tried to explore how the novels could show us a way to think about moral life uh, in a way that contemporary philosophy wasn't doing. Um, I continued to write about German philosophy. I wrote a lot of books about um, Kant, Hegel, Nietzsche, uh, German, German idealism in general. But uh, I started drifting more and more towards this question of how to do philosophy it, it, you know, without without conforming to the conventional standards of the discipline, since I didn't have to, I, I had permission <laughs> not to. Uh, really, the, the most fortunate event in my life was uh, coming here uh, to mm-hmm. Chicago and being able to do that. So, a little later on, uh, I got invited to uh, give a series of lectures called the Castle Lectures at Yale, um, and you know, I could have done standard a standard kind of account of Hegel's political thought, for example. But, um, you know, for, for a general audience, which is what this was, Hegel is not a very friendly topic. I mean, it's, it's extremely difficult. The language is difficult and so forth. So um, I decided really, to, again, given permission to do these sorts of things by the committee, um, I decided to write a book on Hollywood Westerns and um, the way in which Hollywood Westerns um, offered a mode of reflection about things like uh, legal authority, the transition from a pre-legal to a legal system, the emergence of, which is what a lot of great Westerns are about, um, yeah. a bourgeois civilization in, in a hostile environment, railroads, banks, schools, families, security. Uh, how does the ideal of that kind of life get a grip in a situation of complete lawlessness? What, what prompts people to give up the, that situation and uh, cultivate the virtues necessary not not for a kind of honor society uh which was what the pre-legal situation of the of the west was in uh in the post-civil war era um but but the virtues necessary for a comfortable bourgeois life so forth anyway i thought they would say no we don't want that we you know, we want to uh the donor of the series is going to be there and we want the, but they didn't <laughs> yeah, they didn't they just they just said yeah okay fine if you want to write you know so uh, the series is published as a book, so I did I did these lectures at Yale on Hollywood westerns, and then I began to think, well, this is really fun. Uh, <laughs> this this is, allows one to illuminate um, issues in philosophy that we can't get a grip on, um, especially issues that I call political psychology. That is to say, um, what is necessary in the world for a certain kind of claim of normative authority to get a grip on people. How does that happen? It doesn't happen. Political life, philosophers tend to have the illusion that uh, the reason people obey the state is because there's a very good argument for why they should. But nobody um, experiences allegiance to a regime by having Mm. been convinced of uh, an argument suitable for an academic philosophy journal. Uh, so actually, the way in which normative life, moral life, political life, the way in which it works, uh, you know, somewhat surprisingly, is not really accessible to conventional discursive analysis that is mm. the bread and butter of philosophy. So I thought, well, this this might be true of a variety of things. So I got another series, a lecture series invitation from the University of Virginia. And I was at was that time working in Hegel on the problem of agency and responsibility. I mean, how do we know what differentiates uh, an action that I perform from a mere event that happens to me? So I thought, well, you know, that's what really uh, classic 1940s film noir is all about. So I, I said, you know, would you would you let me give lectures on agency and fate, um, you know, the experience of not being able to pick one's own future, of feeling in a way consigned to a future, so the, the, the world of, 
let me know if I'm just running on too much. Or no, if you'd like. I, I, the only thing I want to say is uh, I've had a lot of people on here talk about how exciting philosophy is and uh how important it is and how inspiring it is you might be the first person who like the word fun keeps coming up and i love it i love that your journey is like philosophy as fun um also yeah. uh, a huge fan of um you know i enjoy westerns but especially like noir i grew up with uh, a lot of like old time radio detectives yeah. i read a lot of raymond chandler and so yeah this is this is a lot of fun it's really yeah. it's it's a really fun approach and I, i'm enjoying this yeah actually very amusing there's a very famous literary scholar at virginia and after the first lecture which was on jacques tourneur's film out of the past the first question i got was what are you doing <laughs> 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 what what is this? This is not <laughs> philosophy. This is not film studies. This is uh, not literary analysis. What are you doing? Uh, so I, you know, I tried to give an answer yeah. and, and you know continue. And the University of Virginia also publishes these lectures uh, as a book. So then a, I had a book come out on on uh, film noir. Um, so then you know I I, I got increasingly more interested. I'm still writing about philosophy. Um, but I got uh, particularly more interested in writing about philosophy and and film. So I wrote a book on uh, on Hitchcock uh, called the Philosophical Hitchcock. Um, I wrote a book. Um, I, I put together a collection of a lot of essays I had written on film called Film Thought, Cinema mm -hmm. as Reflective Form. Um, and then I got really interested in melodrama, um, in American melodrama and uh the way in which I thought the great melodramas were actually not not sentimental stories of love and uh, despair, but in, intensely critical of the form of life emerging in the late modern West. Yeah. Um, so I wrote a book about Douglas Sirk, who I think is the greatest melodramatist uh, in the 19, 1950s. Um, uh, forgive me. I, I d actually I don't know. What, what has he written? Well, no, he, this is a filmmaker who, who wrote oh. great melodramas, uh, who directed great melodramas in the 1950s, like uh, All That Heaven Allows, Written on the Wind, um, Imitation of Life. Okay, uh, gotcha. Are, these, are, these, are, these are films that you know, were immensely popular at the time. I mean, this was extremely provocative as a philosophical enterprise because these are films that star Rock Hudson, Jane Wyman, they were just written off as what was then called women's films, you know, sort of sentimental love stories with an enormous overwrought emotionality to them. But I thought they were incredibly subversive, critical mm. documents about the um, aridity and sterility of uh, late modern bourgeois life, especially sort of suburban life, that kind of thing, and the corrupting effects of consumerism and consumer capitalism. Um, so uh, that's basically the, the story of how I drifted from being an English major to being a philosophy professor to being in the Committee on Social Thought released yeah. into uh, this realm of what has now become a kind of sub-discipline of philosophy, film philosophy, film mm -hmm. as philosophy, not philosophy of film. What is it? What kind of aesthetic object is it? But um, that film is a mode of reflective thought. And mm. literature is a mode of reflective thought that philosophy, by attempting to understand, can actually illuminate areas of human life, what it is like to be a human being, that discursive analysis of concepts can't give us. And, you know, what is philosophy except an attempt to understand ourselves? And if we really wanted to understand ourselves, we have these documents that, in a sense, portray ourselves to ourselves in a very thoughtful, reflective way that illuminates part of human experience that can't be illuminated otherwise, which gets to your uh, a remark before about uh, the problem of truth in literature, which is a problem I'm working on now. Oh, really? <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, I would hope you'd come back for that book as well. But uh, <laughs> the um, one of the first things that kind of comes to mind, you're in Chicago. I'm sure you know this name. How does your work um, interact with uh, Dr. Martha Nussbaum? Well, I mean, Martha's been a colleague here for 30 years or so, and she has her own approach to uh, literature as as contributing to philosophy in her book, Love's Knowledge, or in her book on Greek literature, The Fragility 
of goodness. Um, so I, I, I consider myself a kind of fellow traveler in that field. Uh, the difference between us is that she, she tends to think that the primary function of literature in its philosophical dimensions is kind of educative. Uh, it, it, she thinks that it, it kind of can make us better persons. That it's a, a kind of form of moral education contributing to a certain kind of humility about um, our uh, our practices and the confidence we have in them. And that's that's fine. But I I don't I myself don't think that literature makes us better people. Um, <laughs> I think uh, it it can illuminate something that isn't illuminated otherwise. But I have a much more ambitious sense that um, if we think about this seriously, it changes, it should change our conception of philosophy itself. Mm. I don't think Martha thinks that. Um, mm. uh, but um, she's over in the, we're both members of the philosophy department, uh, but she's, uh, like I'm also in the Committee on Social Thought, she's also in the law school. And the law school keeps her keeps her pretty busy. So we've, we've been on some panels together years ago, but um, we don't have a kind of continuous interaction. She, she does her thing. I do my thing. Yeah, for sure. I, uh, and I, I was just curious because there's definite crossover. I've read some of her work as well. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, I was just curious, like, um, partly because of the, the location, you know, that you're at the same spot. Mm -hmm. Um, So what does uh, film give us that discursive philosophy, uh, or literature for that matter, give us that discursive philosophy doesn't? Well, to go back to that question of truth, uh, it gives us a kind of another, another access to, to truth. Now, philosophy um, traditionally has been very skeptical of claims, going all the way back to Plato, right. uh, whose argument was that the, the poets convince us by stirring up our emotions by creating a kind of passionate response to say Greek tragedy or epic Greek literature um, that is very, very untrustworthy, according to Plato, that the poets are just one step away from sophists, that they can manipulate people's emotions to get them to believe things that aren't true. Um, but I don't, uh, I, myself, I don't think that's, that's the right way to look at it. It's it just way too simple to think that great literature, for example, or film works on us merely at the uh, affective or emotional level. It inspires as you watch a great film or read a great work of, of art, literature, poetry, it inspires a form of reflection. Um, why, why is human life being portrayed this way? What's the point? What, what is the uh, work of art attempting to show us? Now, as I said, philosophers are very skeptical about that because they think um, you know, truth is a matter of uh, propositions, things we claim in assertory judgments to be true, and that there must be truth conditions, ways of knowing whether it's true or not for it to have the status of a truth bearer. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the, 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 so the problem with that is it limits possible truth to say a notion of correctness or correspondence that um, if, if, uh, if I say, um, you know, the, uh, the, te the, the melting temperature of copper is 1,700 degrees, I, I understand that before I know whether it's true or not by understanding what it would be if it were true. And the problem with, say, let's just stick with literature or novels, they don't assert anything. They don't claim anything to be true. They're imaginative fictions about imagined fictional characters. But how can that be true? I mean, in the literal sense, it's false. There never was a Hamlet. There never was a Charles Foster Kane. And the stories are false. That's quite simplistic because, of course, literature doesn't pretend to be about real things in the strict literal sense. Um, sometimes real characters show up in fiction, but they're fictionalized. They're not meant to be asserted. And the truth of literature is not that the story is true, it's something else. So the question is, you know, what is something else? What, what is it that literature 
provides us that can't be done by philosophy, as in your, as in your question. I mean, the simplest thing is um, what it is like to be a human being facing mm. uh, dilemmas and situations that are typical of the kinds of things human beings face, uh, especially in say different historical worlds, uh, but worlds that overlap because of the kind of commonality of experience of the human qua human. Um, so uh, the the notion of a, a form of illumination um, or uh, revelation or disclosure. Uh, there's a, there's a, a wonderful phrase by the philosopher uh, Bernard Williams that, uh, that says we ought to distinguish between what we think we think and what we really think. <laughs> and one one function of literature is to show us that what we really think might not be what we think we think. And then it raises a kind of critical question of whether we ought to think that way. So um, as, I, as I say, philosophers are skeptical of this because how do you know that what a literature, a literary object purports to disclose is true? Um, it just pushes the question back to shouldn't it be formulated in a proposition that we can then investigate in another way? I mean, in Upton Sinclair's famous novel, The Jungle, we could say, well, that depiction of factory conditions under under capitalism um, is true. That's that's the way it was. But then we've translated the novel into a discursive proposition. The conditions are these and these and these and these. And then we know how to figure out whether that's true. And one way of figuring out whether it's true is not by reading the novel again. Uh, we have to go somewhere else. So the novel doesn't say anything true. It just provokes us to wonder if the depiction is true and then we switch to the mode of truth bearers, propositions, assertions, judgments, evidence, correspondence. Um, uh, but that doesn't tell us what it was like to live under those conditions. There's no way to translate that into discursive prose. Uh, if we try to do it, um, we get something incredibly clumsy. Um, if you, there, there's a, a famous Shakespeare sonnet uh, Sonnet 130 called, uh, that, that whose first line is, my mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun, goes on to say her lips are not anywhere near as red as beautiful coral and so forth. And they say, well, what, what's, what's Shakespeare trying to say? And somebody says, well, you know, what he's saying is, my love is not very pretty, but uh, she's okay with me. Well, you know, you can sort of see the problem right away. Uh, or, or even more general thing like love is not a function of physical beauty. Right. Well, that, that just misses the whole tonality and aura of the meaningfulness uh, communicated in, in the poem, the deep love communicated in the poem, not, not a concession or anything. Yeah. That, I mean, that makes total sense. Of, like, I mean, the, the function of the poem, like if you, if I say, if I said that to my wife, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said the version yeah, of like, right. hey, um, if I gave her a poem and then I said, by the way, what this means is you're very beautiful, I would literally kill the function of the poem, right? Like, I mean, unless the poem yeah. was just as bad as that explanation. Um, yeah. And so uh, there, there's something else there. Uh, are you familiar with the rule of metaphor by uh, Paul Ricoeur? No. So he has... Uh, he, he has a lot to say about this in terms of um, he uses the uh, the metaphor as kind of this discussion of these kinds of things. And I, it still didn't give me a full answer, but it helped me. It helped, I think, put me on the right path. The idea that when you talk about uh, he's as uh, he's like a lion. And so it's like, oh, he means he's really brave. And it's like if it if you can fully paraphrase something then the metaphor is dead. What that extra something is, is the, is the hard part. And it's precisely the fact that we can't always explain what that extra something is, is that what ma makes literature valuable in and of itself. Um, yeah. So, so that, I don't know. That's a, Go ahead. Yeah, that's a famous old problem. It's called the paradox of paraphrase. And um, there are many writers who've, who've um, written about it, but the challenge that philosophers then present is, well, um, how is it that we're on to something that we can't paraphrase? What what would it mean to be on to it, to be um, uh, to be uh, 
if we can't formulate it determinately and discursively, not only how do we know what it is, because you know, we haven't really distinguished it from what it is not, we can't give it determinate boundaries, the, let's say, in a very general sense, the meaning, the meaningfulness, the significance uh, of the general experience of reading the poem. How are we on to it? And um, how do we get anywhere near the question of it being true if mm -hmm. it can't be reformulated? Um, so uh, in this regard, I've been working lately on uh, the way in which the philosopher Martin Heidegger um, uh, tries to express th this this kind of problem. Um, we're not on to meaningfulness by any kind of cognitive grasp of it, but it's not nothing either. And Heidegger's word for how we're on to it is attunement, German word Stimmung. And it, it has that same kind of musical resonance to be in tune with something. Um, now, that, that's, a, that's a very unusual kind of experiential relation to a work of art or, or to meaningfulness in, it, in a human life. Or if, if we ask somebody, what did it mean to you to go through that war? We don't expect a list of propositions. Um, very often, we expect a kind of narrative. But well, let me tell you a story. And we, we hope by telling the story that someone can get a sense of what it meant to us without being able to give a determinate paraphrase of what the, the, sense, of it, the sense of it is. So there's this, these, these sort of coordinated notions of illumination, disclosure, attunement, truthfulness, the credibility and genuineness of the a disclosure of a kind of deep meaningfulness that also we tend to think of as not just the meaningfulness of what happens to one character and what it's like for that character, but we tend to think of it as typical, as having a, a universal or more general significance than just what it meant for this character and what it means for me personally to read it. Um, we, we tend to think something is illuminated of a very general nature about the human experience. Um, so uh, meaningfulness is not the kind of thing that's subject to strict bivalence and propositional assertions and so forth. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it, would it would be a very crude thing to say, well, therefore, it doesn't exist. There, there isn't anything there other than what can be paraphrased, and if, especially if the question is truth. Uh, mm. if, if, you can't, if you can't say it, um, you, you can't show it either. It's showing saying distinction is crucial to this kind of this kind of discussion but I think it's a very impoverished way of, of, of looking at it uh, it doesn't it doesn't explain for example the the unbelievable hold that Sophocles or Shakespeare or Hamlet uh, or uh, uh, war and peace for example have uh, on the human imagination and the way in which we're gripped by it as revealing something to us, that couldn't be revealed any other way. Uh, and it, I have one, I want to make sure we do talk about your book, but forgive me, I, I can't uh, avoid this, this question. Uh, what do you think about the fact that, uh, is, is part of this discussion, the fact that while we are acted upon and we deal with the truth as it's presented to us, we also act upon the world and we create and we great truth in the world with a, with the power like when we act upon the world we make things true right and so is there something about fiction and about these kinds of things that help us in that creative aspect of truth well um i'm not quite sure what you mean but uh it, it is certainly true that that literature can have a powerful effect um on uh, on it, not just sort of individual um, an individual orientation, let's say, toward the world. We can put it that way: that literature can both reveal and create an orientation, a way of being pointed in life in a certain direction rather than another, um, that we wouldn't have been able to do. Uh, we wouldn't have been able to achieve otherwise. It can be 
uh, transformative. Not not in the uh, going back to what you were saying about Martha uh, Nussbaum. It it, uh, it 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 doesn't necessarily make us any better, but there is. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we we can be changed. Maybe this is what you're getting at. We, yeah. we can be changed by the experience of of great 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 art. I mean, I, I for example, I come from the South, and when I read in college uh, just about everything by Faulkner, um, my my sense of what it was to live in the South and uh, to be haunted by the the sins of the South, mm. uh, the sins that have never been expiated never been uh, acknowledged properly in the South, mm. just the opposite. Yeah. Um, that, that sort of gave me a much different sense of uh, what it was to live in an area haunted by so many ghosts um, who were still quite, you know, sort of in a ghostly sense alive and, uh, and permeating the experience of of living in the South, so, uh, maybe maybe that kind of thing one could say about about literature that it can reorient us in in various ways. I mean, mm. so take, take the issue of film melodramas. Uh, we uh, it's true of a lot of films. There's a kind of first viewing in which you just follow the plot and get emotionally involved, and then you then you then you finish the film. But then you think, well, wait a minute, there's something weird about this aspect of it or that aspect of it. Then you go back and watch it again and you you find, going back to what you think you think and what you think, uh, you, you find, well, what I was taking to be just a kind of straightforward affirmation of a certain romantic form of life in late bourgeois modernity is actually, wait a minute, quite ironic about it, quite critical of it, quite, quite uh, seriously uh, subversive. Um, and, you know, it, it's funny in this regard because the, the reception of many melodramas like Cirque's, um, the reception of them uh, is, uh, is only a first viewing reception. There, people, don't, people don't often have, well, same thing with Western, same thing with film noir, same thing with many Hollywood genres, um, like the thriller or something like in Hitchcock. They don't really realize that there's kind of a trap door in the bottom. You, you know, there's... There, uh, there's another film, another novel inside the novel. So people read Flaubert's Madame Bovary and they just they read it for the plot, and then they don't they don't quite realize the um, the tremendously subversive nature of it or the uh, the enormous literary experimentation of the novel that sort of is trying to change our view of what art is, which is a, a kind of crucial problem. In Late modern art, what's called modernist art, in which the, the the value and function of art is now not taken for granted and is up for grabs. So there's a whole series of artistic works after the 1850s or so, um, in which we get reoriented with respect to the question of art and its function in the world. Yeah, um, and what's interesting is that uh, when you have like this. Uh, these well-made novels and well-made uh, movies um, that people often internalize the the trap door without knowing it's there. Right. Which is the power, yeah, <laughs> which is the, the power true. of uh, one, criticism to reveal like this is what's actually happening to you, but also just the power of the medium itself, which is probably more to Plato's point that <laughs> it's sneaky, but... <laughs> Yeah, well, you, ra you raise also the interesting question of if you if you take this view of literature and this view of truth, this view of cinema or uh, even you know painting, music, what is criticism supposed to be like if it's not paraphrased? Mm. Um, uh, how, how if what's this is one of the chapters, the first chapter in the book? I was what just is, about to ask you about it, so this is perfect. Yeah, um, what is philosophical criticism of? of the arts. Um, uh, you know, it, uh, as we were saying before, it, it can't just be a kind of discursive paraphrase of what truth claims are implicit in the, in the work of art. So what do you write about? Well, um, it's very, very difficult, actually, to, to do it 
uh, at all well or authentically, um, because you have to um, both pay attention to the details, uh, very close attention to the details and how they illuminate something like the the form of self-reflection that any literary object um, embodies. I, I mean by that that um, uh, you know, it's a kind of a funny way of anthropomorphizing works, but um, they're they're actually quite self-conscious. They mm -hmm. they they set out to portray things in a certain way for a certain point to make a certain reason, um, and uh, it's it's you know it, it, to illuminate that without vulgarizing it or simplifying it or all the rest of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you have to try to recreate in your attentiveness to the details, something like the experience of coming to attend to those details. You have to try to embody in a critical uh, account, which is sometimes can be quite detailed. You still have to try to illuminate what it was like to be brought to attend to these details, what it was like to experience them as suddenly salient in the second or third viewing of the film or reading of the novel. Um, so criticism has this task of not only uh, uh, trying to show you what you already know, as you say, without knowing it, mm. but to do so in a way that attends to the dimension of experience one has, this notion of attunement again, of being on to the meaningfulness of the work, um, which isn't a function of you know, a kind of cognitive self-reflection. Um, it, it's, it's a much more deeply experiential modality of uh, attentiveness. And that requires the critic to try to bring that out in the reader of the criticism. Uh, so uh, it, that, that's, that's quite a large topic of what, what is the philosophical point of literary criticism. I mean, until, until the dominance of theory in literary criticism in the, in the 60s and 70s, um, the, the old idea was just sort of philological, uh, you know, to whom is this author indebted? Um, what was the context historically at the time of the production of the work? Uh, what do we know about the various drafts of the work and the changes that were made? What are the literary sources that the author used or the cinematic resource? So, you know, really yeah. just kind of the logical explication. Um, but w once we asked them sort of more radically what, what literature was doing in, in, this, in this case philosophically, um, we have to have a different mode of criticism as well. Hmm. And then, uh, so you have philosophical criticism in that first chapter, and then you have philosophical fiction. And what makes fiction philosophical? Well, it has to do with this notion of literary form. Um, you know, the, the, uh, this is a function both of the structure of the plot and the nature of the characters, but also the decision an author makes about how to present the material, how to uh, actually um, organize and show us um, the various elements that, say, make up a, 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 a realist fictional novel, um, and then try to... Um, present them in a way in which the implicit reflectiveness of the work, it's, it's always also being about itself, being about why it is presenting the material this way rather than that way. Um, this, this dimension of, of literary or cinematic form is the, the key to it. Now, now, I should say, I mean, sometimes the, if, you, if you raise the question of, well, you know, it's one thing for the to follow the plot and understand what's going on. It's another thing to ask, why is it being presented this way rather than that way? The answer can sometimes be to entertain us, right. to thrill us, to scare us. Because, uh, you know, literature and film are also commercial products. They're, they're made for audiences. And even, Very in the much case so. of, even in the case of high art like Henry James, he wanted the books to be sold, to be read. Uh, so sometimes you can say, well, that's that's the main point. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, sometimes the point is to make something beautiful. Mm. Sometimes the point is to experiment with literary form. Uh, sometimes the point is to comment on other literature, you know, intertextuality. But with great works, 
many of them, not all of them, and we certainly admire um, great, great works of art without any interest in whether they have a philosophical dimension or not. Some of them don't. Many of them don't. But in the case of works that, that seem quite philosophically ambitious, we get a sense that we're being shown something in order to reveal something we might not have attended to that is a truth about human experience. This, of course, raises the question, well, if, if they're not universally quantified propositions, uh, what's the nature of generality in this illumination by a fictional object? I mean, you've got a story about a man who goes to Europe to rescue a boy who's been trapped or, or whose relatives think he's being manipulated by a, a married woman who's with whom he's living with an affair. And then the man stays long enough to realize that actually the guy is better off than he would be going back to this boring town that he came from. Um, we, when, you know, you could say, well, that's just a really interesting story. Or you could say, well, isn't James in his novel, The Ambassadors, isn't he, isn't he kind of trying to make a point about uh, the, the experience of a kind of European culture whose value system is fading, collapsing, and an, a, an unattractive kind of American context in which the kind of self-consciousness and moral self-righteousness uh, of the American experience of itself is actually not a suitable counterpoint to the, the sort of decadence and uh, collapsing value system of the Europeans, and you realize, well, wait, something very quite typical is being said about the emerging form of moral life in late modern capitalism. Um, and so you, 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 know, you, you, you realize as you, you read the ambassadors, that this is not meant just to entertain us, or it's trying to say something quite general about the, the state of our sense of how we ought to be living in a world in which many of the common assumptions about that have collapsed and we don't we don't really find them credible anymore we don't really we don't really have our bearings yet in this world that's emerging in pre-world right right before the world war one sort of exploded um the illusion that we did have a kind of common solid moral foundation uh, but that but raises that the question of of generality, of how, how a singular work about a singular character can have general significance. Uh, is there something almost phenomenological about, uh, about that generality and that kind of, in the great works of art, this is why you have certain works of art that seem to go beyond time. You know, look at people recognize themselves in Hamlet and King Lear, these sorts of things. And it, I think that there's a, the generality comes from recognition, right? That people continually over and over again recognize their own selves uh, and specifically their own subjective consciousnesses as represented. Is that a fair way to think yeah. about it? Sure, yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I would put the, the, the problem this way as well. Um, since Plato and Aristotle, there have been two general ways of thinking in philosophy about universality or generality. One is abstractive. Um, you try to leave out particular elements and keep abstracting to a commonality that gives you something shared by all of the particulars. So questions like human nature, you, you try to you know, exclude things that are particular to various cultures and experiences until you get something that's shared by all of them. Very abstract notion of generality, the least mm. common denominator or the most common denominator, that kind of thing. The but, essence. Um, yeah. But, but Plato clearly is interested in a, in a that, that's more an Aristotelian conception of generality, of inductive generality. Uh, but Plato clearly thought with his theory of ideas that there's another kind of of generality, which has more to do with uh, a, a kind of concrete typicality, it's something that in influenced Hegel quite a lot. I mean, the idea is very simple. If uh, it, I, I might say to you, for example, um, now take Michael Jordan. That's a basketball player. That's what a basketball player is. He embodies, by being the particular he is, more perfectly than any other player. I mean, I play basketball, but I'm not typical of basketball. I'm a 
a shadow, a faint, faint shadow of Michael Jordan, who is like the idea of a basketball player, but in a concrete particular. So that's not abstractive universality. That's not uh, inductive universality. That's a way in which a singular instance can be, in its perfection, representative of a kind of typicality. And that okay. is what I think. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, first of all, all Chicagoans are very proud of you for <laughs> referencing Michael Jordan and not another player. Um, well, my name, my name, you, my name is Pippin. <laughs> yes, you, ha you have to. Um, what, would this be uh, similar? Is this kind of where you think uh, Kant is going with his idea of exemplars? The, yeah, some, the, the creation mean, of judgment uh, of categories. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, in his aesthetic theory, um, I mean, Kant, Kant was really interested mostly in the beauty of nature, but he does have a theory of uh, the role of beauty in art. Um, but he thinks he has a much more restricted view. Uh, he thinks the, the, the greatest achievement of uh, a kind of typicality in artworks is the, um, the capacity of an artwork um, to interest us, to create a kind of passionate involvement with it that isn't um, self-interested or a mere matter of pleasure. Uh, that uh, this is this is his famous claim that beauty in works of art, for example, is a symbol of morality. That is to say, the the experience of artworks, or especially the beautiful in nature, compels us in a way that can help us understand that our vocation in life is not just pleasure seeking, because we're we're not interested in the aesthetic object as a means for enjoyment. I mean, if the work is genuinely artistic, and this is quite an interesting point Kant makes, um, it, its effect on us is not to think of it like a, a good glass of wine or a good meal or um, you know whatever kind of pleasant experience where an object is a mere means. We feel the object has a certain kind of authority over us and demands a mode of attentiveness that is pleasant, but not self-interested pleasure. It's, it's a way of uh, in, what Kant calls our supersensible nature. We don't have to get into the metaphysics of that, but just to say our, our, we, we get a sense that we, and this is in general in Kant what, um, what he thought of as, you know, the kind of most awe-inspiring feature of human beings, that sensual animals, though they are, they are capable of acting for the sense of a moral ideal in a way that would injure or destroy all of their sensible self-interest. Even their love for their family could be sacrificed for the sake of what's right. We, we have this capacity. And God thought, well, that's one of the things I stand in awe of. Two mm. things fill me with awe, the starry heavens above and the moral law within. Mm. And art can play into that by showing us that we have a capacity for uh, an involvement in a comportment with objects in the world that create a kind of pleasure that's well beyond particular self-interested pleasure, but uh, has a kind of uh, intellectual or, uh, you know, a, a dimension of purity that connects with our moral moral vocation. So uh, mm -hmm. artworks can exemplify that in a way that um, can convince us, reassure us that our general vocation in life uh, is, is not as self-interested pleasure-seeking beings but we have the capacity of actually suspending all of that for mm. the sake of something that isn't merely self-interested pleasure. Um, and in artworks, say, it can be a kind of pleasure that um, is distinctive in the fact that it's not, it, it's ennobling pleasure, a kind of self-elevation in convincing us that we can tend to things um, in a way that doesn't, doesn't actually have anything to do with our purely sensible natures. Yeah. Um, so I want to be conscious of your time. Uh, do you mind uh, kind of a, as we uh, wrap things up, just talking a little bit uh, for a concrete example of what you're talking about with philosophical criticism and philosophical fiction, your chapter on Proust, uh, A Shadow of Love, 
Or is it The Shadow yeah. of Love? Yeah, uh -huh. it's about jealousy. The Shadow so, of Love, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, first great novel uh, involves uh, like basically four crucial love affairs over the course of its three 3,000 pages. Um, and uh, in all of them, what plays an enormously powerful role is jealousy. Um, mm. a, a, a character, a lover, a beloved's, but mostly a, a lover's um, anxiety that um, the person they love doesn't share the same dimension of love that they do. And so what actually that typifies is the, the tremendous uncertainty in all human relationships. Um, we, we want to be taken by others to be the way we take ourselves. But if we, if we actually work at trying to ensure that the other takes ourselves, takes us the way we take ourselves, um, we end up kind of creating a fictional self that we, a kind of persona that mm. we present to the world, which then creates the anxiety that we're not being loved or attended to for ourselves, but for the for the character we've created in order to be attended to as ourselves. So jealousy typifies a great deal of the general unknowingness in, mm. in human social relations. And Proust is trying to, I mean, people find it sometimes when they first read the novel kind of strange that Proust thinks that love is really always a matter of jealousy. That, that uh, I mean, we tend to think of jealousy as a kind of character flaw. Well, you don't trust me. I mean, I've given you no reason to think I'm betraying you. But actually, a much more deep level in proof that I try to bring out in that chapter, um, in which the problem of jealousy is unavoidable. It's not because people are pathological and they're possessive and they don't want the person to be with anybody else. It's that they don't know if they play a role in the person's imagination that they think they do, that they would like mm. to play. And so they're constantly searching for reassurances in a way that can be actually quite destructive of, of the relationship. It's very hard to avoid this problem. I mean, people mm. say, well, oh, these people are just pathological. They're not, they're not really interesting characters because they're all neurotic. They're, they just can't. But, uh, you know, this is, again, a first reading, second reading, third reading kind of thing. You know, you, you, on the first way through, you think, these, God, these corrupt, decadent people, they just can't relax and enjoy each other. And, <laughs> you know, uh, but... Uh, Second or third time through, you realize, well, something else is going on here. There's a really big, huge um, philosophical problem in the relation between self-knowledge and knowledge of others, um, that the dynamic involved in being taken to be who one wants to be taken to be um, actually, however unavoidable, it complicates things um, uh, a, a great deal. And Proust also you know, shows us there's something about this that's that's not just uh, destructive, but quite important. It mm -hmm. is it it accounts for this uncertainty in romantic relationships. Uh, accounts for a kind of um, constant tension that actually makes the relationship much more important. Doesn't take it for granted. It's actually a way of enhancing the, I mean, making the relationship more honest by acknowledging to oneself one's own uncertainty about this and how how limited the ways are you know like asking asking the person do you do you really love me do you um, do you think you really understand me well that's not going to get you anywhere it's like the general problems we've been talking about you can't discursively convince somebody by an argument that they don't have anything to worry about um, we always <laughs> therefore have i about. love you yeah sorry yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> but we always have something to worry about. Uh, but that's not unexpected because uh, human interaction, these self-knowledge and knowledge of others of us and our knowledge of them has a kind of dynamic. I mean, Henry James is good at this as well. Mm. You know, he's always portraying scenes in which the question is, does she know that I know that she knows that I know kind of thing? Um and we don't really notice that in everyday life. It's much too complicating a relationship. But when we sort of step back 
and have a literary expression of it, then our own sense of what we've taken for granted in our relationships and our lack of self-knowledge about the sort of underlying anxiety involved in all close relationships uh, gets illuminated and we learn something and we learn mm. something true. Mm. Well, I think that's a great place to, to wrap up. Um, Dr. Pippin, hey. thank you so much. If the, um, is there one last takeaway you'd leave for our, our uh, listeners? Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure. Take care. Peace.